All right. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, first and foremost, I want to ask that we just remember uh, Pastor Burgess right now. He's not uh, feeling well. Uh, he wasn't feeling well uh, this morning. He texted me earlier uh, in the morning and told me that he just wasn't uh, feeling it at all today, but he was going to plow through uh, the first service and possibly the second. But, you know, obviously he's not here, so he's not feeling well. So just remember him and his family, I believe he told me of one, I can't remember which one of his sons was uh, sick and those same symptoms uh, he's starting to feel as well. So just remember him in your prayers as well. Um, so I was, I was not uh, anticipating preaching today, but uh, sometimes you just get thrown in and that's why you always have to be ready. You know, so uh, in Jeremiah chapter 35, um, uh, there in chapter 35, Jeremiah, we are going to uh, look at this family called the Rechabites. Now, I'll just ask you, you know, it's a pretty small crowd today, and I, I can understand why I'm not saying everybody who's not here is, you know, in their beds, sleeping or anything, but it's a good day to do something like that right now. It's rainy, you know, and your flesh is like, I really want to be in the bed right now. It's chilly outside, it's rainy, and um, good time to just be in the bed, you know, but i uh, glad to uh, be here and glad to see you guys here as well. And uh, I say that to just say that I hope this sermon is not a boring sermon to you. You know, it is the word of God. So, you know, don't have the thought that oh, I could be in the bed or so or anything like that. So hope that you get something out of it. Um, the title of uh, the sermon this evening is Lessons from the Rechabites. Lessons from the Rechabites. And this is one of my favorite chapters uh, in the book of Jeremiah because reading the book of Jeremiah, when you read it, it, it sort of has a theme to it where it's just like one of those books where it's just uh, strictly gloom and doom. It's, it's so much uh, warning and admonition about a, a uh, people that are coming from far. Uh, obviously, he's talking about the Babylonians. They're going to come and they're going to carry them off because of all their idolatry, their rejection against God. So that's pretty much the theme when you read chapter 1 through uh, 34. But then uh, uh, there comes a time where uh, I, I would say this, um, chapter 1 through, I would say, 28, uh, where it's a consistent theme of just, uh, I would say, a destruction that is coming. But then from chapter 29 to 34 is where you have some positivity, where the Lord is saying, you know, that famous verse, as everyone know. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, you know, thoughts of peace and not of evil. So at, at that point from chapter 29 all the way through 34, you get some positivity in the book of Jeremiah where God is promising he's going to bring them back. He's going to bless that land. But then in chapter 35, when you read it, it just kind of takes a turn to this family called the Rechabites. And, it, and really, it's, it's one of those things when you're reading it, it's like, who are these people? Where do they come from? Why are they so significant? In the book of Jeremiah that the Lord just tells Jeremiah, hey, go get the family of the Rechabites. Go find them. Go bring them to the house of the Lord. So I want to use the Rechabites uh, today as our lessons learned. And as I mentioned, the title of the message is uh, Lessons from the Rechabites. So the thing is, who are the Rechabites? You know, where, where did they come from? Because there is not much in the Bible about them. And the thing is, there are certain names in the Bible where there is a repeat name. It doesn't always mean it's the same person. So this name, Rechab, very well is used beforehand. But the thing is, uh, when he goes, and I'm going to make this uh, pretty much simple to understand about where they come from. Because for one, they, they tell you about their background, where they come from, how did they end up in Jerusalem. For one, look at verse 11. We get some background about these people the Rechabites, or the house of Rechab, as the Lord calls them. Look at verse 11. Um, they are talking to Jeremiah, and uh, Jeremiah sits wine before them. And in verse 10, they're explaining some things to Jeremiah. They say, but we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But it came to pass when now they're telling you where they come from. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. So here we see, OK, well, for one, these people are not of Jerusalem. They're not of Israel because they told you 
why they came to Jerusalem, which means that they were not in Jerusalem at first. They tell you in verse 11, because of Nebuchadnezzar, because of Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, as it's pronounced here in this passage, king of Babylon came up into the land that we said. So Nebuchadnezzar came up into their land. He was coming to basically seize their land. And then it said, for that reason is why they said, let us go to Jerusalem, as they said in that verse there. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, come and let us go to Jerusalem. Now, here's the reason that they wanted to go to Jerusalem, not only because of Nebuchadnezzar, but then notice this, for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. So they're explaining that the reason we came to Jerusalem is because we feared the Syrians. We feared the Chaldeans. We feared Nebuchadnezzar. So he was coming to take over the land. So they said the best thing for us to do, they said, let us set up shop. Let's dwell in Jerusalem. So this is the big key to this passage because these are people who don't live in Jerusalem. These are people who are not from Israel, yet they end up in Israel. They end up in Jerusalem because they were trying to get away from Nebuchadnezzar when he came and took over the land. Okay, so with that being said, let's uh, pick up in verse 1. The Bible says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jeazaniah, this is Jeremiah talking, then I took Jeazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites, and I brought them into the, into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igladiah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Maaseah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. Verse 5, he said, And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. So, you know, it's only right that because uh, this is a big portion of the story where they are brought into the house of the Lord and Jeremiah say, I put before them wine. So he's setting wine before them. And the reason I want to, I can't just breeze over this point here because people look for all type of reasons uh, to, to drink wine, to be alcoholics. People look for any reason to, to just look at the Bible and say, see, it, it's for, the Bible is for drinking wine. It's for alcohol. There's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. Even Jeremiah here, the Bible said he took pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. And, you know, I want to deal with this because most people will look at this and say, yes, yeah, see, there's a reason why it's okay to drink because God is telling Jeremiah to put wine before them. Well, here's the thing. Obviously, there is a different type of wine here that Jeremiah is putting before the Rechabites. You know, in general, this is where you just have to use some logic where some people can say, well, that's a contradiction right there. Because why is God telling the house of Rechab to drink wine? Well, let's just use some logic here because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Also, Proverbs chapter 23, you don't have to turn to these, but it's, it's a point that I'm building up to here. He says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek midst wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. So the thing is, when, if you were to just look at that scripture there, the, look at the scriptures we just seen, what we just listened to, where the Lord is saying, okay, don't look at it. He's telling you that you're going to have babblings, you're going to have woes, you, you're going to have contentions. And then he says that if, if you do partake, he says wine is a mocker, so it's going to make a mockery out of you. He says strong drink is raging, which means that raging is talking about anger. You're going to become something that you're normally not, that alcohol is going to bring out another side of you. Now, think about that. Why would then God say put wine before the house of a cab and have them to drink? 
doesn't add up. The scriptures we just read, we see where God is saying, stay away from it. Don't even look at it is what he's saying, right? And then in verse five, notice what Jeremiah says. And I set before the house of the son, the sons of the house of, of the Rechabites, pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink. Well, you think about this. If that was the case where it was fine for them to drink and God is putting before them alcohol and telling them to drink. Well, wouldn't Jeremiah be in the sin right now as well? Why would he be in the sin? Well, this is why he would be in the sin. Did, did, did not the Bible say, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink? That putteth thy bottle to him and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So now Jeremiah would be in sin if he's setting pots full of wine, pots full of alcohol before them, and then telling them to chug up. So the thing is, God is not trying to tempt people to sin. When you look at this, the temptation that God is tempting them with, the house of Rechab, is not to see if they can hold their liquor. It's not to see how much they can drink before they just fall over and vomiting everywhere. That is not what God is trying to get to. But we're going to get to what God is, is using the house of Rechab for. The thing is, is that God does not tempt people with sin. And the same thing in this case, God is not tempting them to sin, to partake of a alcoholic beverage that he has clearly lined out in his word and says, don't even look on it. Don't even drink it. The Bible says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. We have to understand that the word tempt in the Bible is not always used as we use it today, where people will say, oh, you know, God is tempting me. Where there is a, a, a temptation that God can, you know, bring your way, where there is a tempting, but you have to get the context of what that temptation is. There's a, a time where God is tempting someone, like one of my favorite temptations is Abraham and Isaac, where God is tempting I, uh, Abraham. He wants to see if he's going to be faithful, if he would uh, uh, sacrifice his son Isaac that is a temptation there right but then you have the temptations that I hear often I heard this many times and it's so funny I was just home last week I was just back in Chicago last week and I heard this even last week and I was I, I can't count how many times I heard this where people would say yeah I feel like God is tempting me with all these women right now but really you know, it's people who would say, yeah, you know, uh, you know, it's a, a room, all these women. And I think God is just trying to tempt me to see how faithful I can be with all these women in the room. No, that's that's not God tempting you to see, you know, if you can control yourself in the midst of 100 women in the room and seeing if you're going to be faithful. You cannot blame that on God and say God is tempting me right now. No, as the Bible say at the end, but every man is drawn away of his own lust. No, you in a room full of 100 women because you wanted to be in there. You can't blame that on God. So people will, will often say that God is tempting me. God is bringing something my way and trying to see how faithful I can be. No, God is not trying to tempt you to sin. That, that, that just doesn't add up with what the Bible teaches us. But will God tempt you and try your faith? Absolutely. Yes, he will do that. God will do that. So tying this back in with the Rechabites, God is not trying to see Jeremiah put these, this, these, he said, pots full of wine. Put all this wine in front of them and let's see if they will drink it or not. Hey, let's see if they're going to get drunk or not. That's not what God is trying to tempt these people with. He's not trying to test them in this type of manner. But here's the thing. It's clearly a wine that they could look upon. It's clearly a wine that they could drink and it would not be sin. Obviously, God is, is bringing this out for a point, but this is not a practice where a, a wine is set before them and, and they would sin. But it's a wine that they can look on and it's not considered to be a sin. 
and you would, and it's strictly the Bible is just saying here that obviously this is some type of beverage that they can consume if they were to look upon it. If they wanted it, it would be some type of juice that they can consume and it would not be a sin. And obviously, as some may know, the Bible just refers to wine at times as to juice. That's what it is before it becomes the poison. The Bible says in the latter end of um, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 2, it says, I would cause thee to drink of the spiced wine, excuse me, I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 14 calls it the pure blood of the grape, right? It's, it's pure. It's, it's good. You can consume that before it then becomes poison at some point. So God is not tempting them to see how loyal, excuse me, God is tempting them, excuse me, God is tempting them to show how loyal they can be, to, to, to show how faithful they are. That's what God is, is using these, uh, these pots full of wine for. That's what he's trying to get to. So let's get to the meat of the lesson, right? The meat of the lesson here, what are we talking about? The lesson here is talking about lessons from the Rechabites. And God wanted to use the house of Rechab as a lesson to the house of Israel. And guess what? Can it be, can it be a lesson to us as well? Yeah, we, we can learn something from the Rechabites as well. Well, here's the thing. Let's, let's look at them and see what we can get from them. Lesson number one from the Rechabites, we learn that, number one, the Lord has his eyes upon the house of Rechab. The Lord had his eyes upon the house of Rechab. Look at verse one. The Bible says, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, go unto the house of, of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord into, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. The Lord had his eyes upon the house of Rechab. And when God is looking at the house of Rechab, what does he see? Well, obviously, if you, if you were paying attention to the, uh, to the rest of this chapter here, we see that when God looks at the house of Rechab, he see a people that are grave. He see a people that are sincere, a people that uh, are a people of integrity a people that can hold fast to their father's word is what, they, is what he can see. And then he see that they're not a treacherous people. They're not lying children. They're not disobedient children. They're not a rebellious people. That is what God sees when he looks down and see them. And the thing is, God was looking at how they were conducting themselves, how they carried themselves, and said, I'm going to use them for an example. Well, here's the thing, you, you, can, you don't have to turn it if you can if you want, but this is just common that in the scriptures, God is looking upon everyone. The book of Job, Job chapter 1, when Satan has this conversation with God, something that the Lord tells Satan, he said in verse 8, Job chapter 1, verse 8, he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then he says in chapter 2, verse 3, this is after the first temptation, then Satan comes again. It says, and the Lord said unto Satan, has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and he still holdeth fast his integrity, Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. What do we see here? That God was looking at Job. Yet Satan, what is he doing? He's walking around as a roaring lion, right? What is he looking to do? He's looking to devour someone. That's what he wants to do. And, and God brings up Job. Has thou considered my servant Job? Well, what is it about Job that God sees concerning Job? Well, it says that he's an upright man. He eschews evil. He said there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an and, and upright man, one that feareth God and assureth evil. The next chapter talks about how he holds fast to his integrity. What we see is that God is looking at you. He's looking at me. He's looking at the house of a cab. He's looking at Job. 
And also, as I mentioned, he's looking at us as well, right? So the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So God is looking at how you conduct yourself. God is looking at how you carry yourself. He's looking at if you are really an upright person. He's looking to see if you really are a person of fidelity and integrity, a person of uprightness. And here's the thing. Also, does he see the wicked things that we do as well? Absolutely, yes. Because the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And here's the thing. It is really easy on a Sunday to look holy, right? Right. You can come Sunday and have all the church jargon and quote all the scriptures and, and, and have good fellowship here and, and talk. And, yeah, I'm praying for you, brother. I'm praying for you, sister. You, you can have all the right lingo. But then the, the question is, well, what do you do when you leave here? Because that's who you really are. It's easy to put on the front and put on the persona when, when you're here in front of people. But then when you leave, we're not there. But you know who is there? The Lord is there because the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So you can fool man, but you can't fool God. God knows what is going on outside of the church, right, when you leave here. And here's a, just a, a secondary application that God's eye is uh, upon the, the Rechabites, right? We see that. But what's interesting is that God, this is just proof that God's eye is also on those who are not part of the household of faith. Those who are not part of the household of faith, do you think God is still looking at them? Absolutely, yes. Why? Because are the Rechabites of, of the Israelites? No, they're not. Yet, you know what God said? Hey, bring those people near. I, I want to use them. Bring, bring them near. Well, it seemed as though, although they were not part of the household of faith, God still looked out and said, I could use them. I, I could do something with them. It's just to prove that God's eye is still can, uh, uh, to be, uh, God's eye is still on those who are not part of the household of faith. Those who are not saved, God is still looking out at them as well. And you say, well, what's the purpose of this? Why do you bring this up? Well, because, you know, we, we in this, this culture today that is really big on Zionism, right? Where people are just, has this notion that God only cares about Jerusalem. That God only cares about these people. Whether it's white people who claiming that we're the Jews, we're the true Jews. Or whether it's black people, black Hebrew Israelites, who say that, no, we're the true Jews. I think this is about two years ago. This is the first time I was out soul winning and came across a Hispanic, a Hispanic family who told me that they were the real Jews. I didn't even come there asking who were the real Jews. I came there to preach salvation. And they said, we don't need the salvation. They said, we are the Jews of the Bible. I'm like, I never heard the Mexicans say that. I, I heard it from the black Israelites. You got those who are over in, uh, in Israel who say that they're the the uh, true Jews and everything. But here's the thing. That doesn't impress God. Your ethnicity doesn't move God. One ethnicity over another. That, that doesn't impress God. Not at all. So this is just interesting how, uh, and, uh, and I bring that up, is, is because God is not just buying into the notion that people have today that God is just all for the Jews, Jews, Jews. No, no, he, he's not just for the Jews. He's looking for whoever will serve him in truth and in spirit. That's who he wants. It does not matter their ethnicity. And just like the Rechabites, here's the thing. It didn't matter who they were. They were not of Jerusalem, yet God was looking to use them as an example. First lesson we see, the lessons from the Rechabites. God had his eyes on the Rechabites. Lesson number two. You can turn back to Jeremiah chapter 35 if you did turn from there. Jer uh, Jeremiah chapter 35, the second lesson from the Rechabites, we see that they are all in unity when it comes to the doctrine laid out from their father. I know that's a, a long one if you're writing that. I'll repeat it. They are all in unity when it comes to the instruction. When it comes to the doctrine that is laid out from their father, they are all in unity. 
Look at verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 35, verse 5. Jeremiah is speaking here. He says, And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, Drink, eat wine. Notice the unity. But they said, We will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Did you see the unity there? There is unity in what they have been taught, not only what they've been taught, but what they have received. What they hold to, they said, we will drink no wine. Notice that there is unity and there's no division. Notice there isn't no one that say, hey, speak for yourself with that one. I, I want to drink. No, but they say, no, we, we, all, we all in unison on this. We don't drink wine. That's not what we do. <laughs> so we see the unity that this family has. And then here's the thing. I think verse 3 is interesting because I don't know what size this family is, but regardless of the size of the family, whether small or big, there's just unity in what they have been taught, what they have received, what they have believed. Verse 3 says, Then I took Jeazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and then notice this, and the whole house of the Rechabites. I don't know how many people that is. He said, the sons, and then this person's sons, and then this person's brethren. Then he just said, the whole house of the Rechabites. And notice verse 5, excuse me, verse 6, we will drink no wine. There is unity Regardless of how big these people are, how small they are, there is unity in the house of the Rechabites is what we see. <clears throat> when it comes to the doctrine that they've been taught, what is the doctrine? No wine. They uphold that. And here's the thing, they already settled on it. They're in the same unity when it comes to the instruction. They already know what they believe. They already settled. There is no conversation wondering, well, well, is there a possibility? Will you do? No, it is none of that. There's no division, no schisms in this family. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And while you turn there, I'll quote... The Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I mean, that describes the house of Rechab right there. It's a beautiful thing. These people, they just settle. No, we, we don't drink. And then we're going to get into some other things that they say that we don't do. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Thing is, this application for us, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is good. The Bible says it is good when we dwell in unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment he's admonishing this church beseeching this church the church of Corinth which we know you read the book of Corinth there's a lot of issues going on in that church a lot of wicked things going on in the church and yet he's telling them listen get on the same page you know don't don't have any divisions and we know they get to a point where there is I of Paul I of you know Apollos and, and I of Christ no divisions dwell together in unity is what they need to do is what we need to do as well. And with that being said, we have to be careful about letting, you know, things creep in, letting leaven just creep in. Because what's going to ha happen with leaven? It's going to spread, right? It's going to spread. So we have to be careful about that. And that, that type of leaven, the type of things that will creep in that will cause a division, that's going to cause schisms. So those are the things we have to be careful about. And when we tie that into the Rechabites, 
they were people of unity. They were people that were on just one accord and, and they knew what they believed and they were settled on that. You could not move them from what they be, uh, had believed. So how does that apply with us again? Well, the thing is, is that I, one thing I like about this church is that no matter who you talk to, there is a unity here. And, it's, and I like the recognize here as an example because their unity is what they have been, is based around what they have been instructed. It's based around the doctrine that they have been taught. And I look at that here in, in this church that, listen, there is a unity when it comes to the things that, that we know of the Bible and what's being taught here. There is a unity in the things that are being taught here. There's no division when it comes to the doctrine that is taught here, but we see that there is a unity in those things. Now, here's the thing. You say, well, what is, what, name something where there is a unity. Well, just simply, just starting with the fundamentals, the salvation. Salvation, I see that is a, a doctrine here where there is unity, where the doctrine that is taught here and what is preached here and which has been received here and what is preached outdoors leaving here is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and that alone for salvation. I see a unity here with this church in those forms. The fact that salvation is a free gift. It's not of your works. We cannot earn it. It's nothing we can do. Not only that, but also that salvation is everlasting, that it is eternal, that you can't lose it. Now, you say, well, what's the big deal with that? Isn't that all churches? No, it's not. Because you may have people who are in the pew, in the chairs, who may believe everything I just said, but then the pastor don't believe that. So how is that unity where the people are right on salvation, but then the preacher, the pastor, is not right on salvation? And then you have this group over here who say, yeah, it's by faith alone. But then the left side who say, yeah, faith alone, but you got to endure until the end. Yeah, and if I endure until the end, then I can keep my salvation. Well, that, that's no unity there. That's no unity there. So the thing that I like about this church here is that there is unity in the doctrine that is taught here. Now, here's the thing. Does that mean we're going to agree with everything? All type of doctrine. No, that's why I said the fundamentals, because how I always look at this is that if you have the fundamentals right. There's a great chance that even if you're wrong on something else, you can grow into learning something that you're off on. I guarantee just about everyone in here probably was off when it came to the pre-trib rapture versus after the tribulation, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I guarantee you it was a lot of people. All, I'll speak for myself. I was off on that. I fell into the doctrine of, hey, yeah, Christ is coming back and we're going to be raptured up out of here. You know, but then guess what? There's a time when you grow into learning those things. So are we always going to agree on just everything? Absolutely not. I'll tell you now, my interpretation of Ezekiel chapter one will be different from Brother Devin. If anybody know what Ezekiel chapter 1 is, I guarantee we all will be a difference on that. If you're saying, well, what's Ezekiel chapter 1? Well, when you have this angel who has four faces and then he has this wheels and the spirit uh, is connected to the wheel. And wherever he go, the wheel goes there. And there. I can say one thing, but Brother Devin and, and Brother Will and Brother Peter, we all can say something different on that. Does that mean that there is no unity? No. Now, y'all let me know when y'all figure what Ezekiel 1 is all about, and, and we'll go from there, because that's a tough chapter, right? But the thing is, there is unity here, and, and at least if there is unity in the, in the fundamentals of the faith, you can grow and get those other things that may be the tougher meat of the word. So the house of Rechab, there is a unity amongst the house of Rechab. Let's go back to uh, Jeremiah chapter 35. 
Second lesson we see is unity. The third lesson that we see from the house of the Rechabites is that they know what the doctrine says. They know what the instructions are. They know the word that has been taught to them. Look at verse 6. The Bible says, but they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Notice they're, they're, they're reciting back to him. Hey, no, no, no. This, this is what the word is. You know, not only did they just receive the doctrine, but this is a family that also, they just know the doctrine as well. They didn't just receive it blindly. Well, dad said we shouldn't drink any wine, so we're not going to drink any wine. No, they didn't just hear it, but, but they received it as well. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't just be a person that just receives doctrine. Just receiving it, you know, because all doctrine is not good doctrine. And, and you can find yourself being simple. And what did the Bible say about being simple? The simple believer in every word. You don't want to be that person that just believes every word. You want to diligently, after you hear those things, okay, I'm going to search the scriptures daily. I'm, I'm, I want to see if those things are so. So make sure you're not a person who just, uh, you just quick to just receive the doctrine and don't know why you're receiving it. But search the scriptures. Get, get solid on what you believe. Here's a good example. Like if, if, you, if you are a woman who... Uh, you dress, you dress counter-cultural, right? You, you're not going with the trend of the world. You don't wear the mini skirts. You don't wear jeans or so. Okay, if you're doing that and someone asks you why, do you, why do you wear a dress? Why do you do that? Well, it's a shame if you just say, well, that's just what I was taught. That's just what my church teach. You know, if, if you're doing something just because that's what the church teach, you, you need to check yourself. That's not a good reason to just do something because it's taught at your church. But it's good to have solid scripture to prove this is why I do what I do. This is why I believe what I believe. It's good to have those things because other than that, it's just a shame if you don't have a reason as to why you do those things. Another one, I just think about like displaying your child, you know, or anything, any type of adultery, whatever it is, make sure you have a reason and, and enough supporting scripture. I don't care if it's one scripture. The more scripture, the better. But at least have one scripture to explain why you choose to stay home and raise your kids. Why you choose to go off as a man and provide and your, and your wife stay at home? It's, it, whatever the situation is, have a foundation of Scripture where you say, this is why I do what I do. You know why? Because people will bring the fight to you. You don't have to go looking for the fight. People will bring it to you where you're just minding your business. You know, why don't you drink it? Company outing, right? Something at the, at the office or so. And then, hey, I notice you're not drinking. Everyone else is drinking. Why don't you drink? Just think about this answer. Well, my church said no drinking. That's, that's not a good, you know, you, you, you want to answer why I don't drink? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not why. That's a good Right there. And you just watch those people. You know what they're going to start doing? Make a mockery out of themselves. They're going to become enraged. So, yeah, that's a good reason. But if you just, well, mm, uh, well, my husband just told me to stay home. Really? Because you know what the world is going to say? Well, girl, you better than that. 
you better than that. You letting him hold you back? You know what you can do with your degrees and, and your career? And then you start, you know, looking at your husband like he's the bad guy. So be ready to give an answer. Have some scripture as to why you believe and, and, and know the doctrine. Know what you believe. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, here's the thing. It's quite embarrassing if someone asks you why you do what you do and you don't have an answer. Now, isn't the example that I gave about, you know, let's say I don't drink and you, why don't you drink? Uh, the church. Isn't that quite embarrassing? It, to me, it makes it seem like you're in a cult. Where, because that's what cults do. They, part of their, their issue is that they're just doing things and don't know why they, they just have some clown joker who just dragging them around and doing all time, and they don't know why they follow him. Just, well, Father said. So it, it's an embarrassment when you don't have an answer. Here's a pet peeve of mine. It is an embarrassment if someone comes to you and asks you, man, I, I, I want to be saved. Can you tell me how I can get saved? And you don't have an answer? What a shame. What a shame for saved people who can't get another person saved. I think, I think that's a slap in the face because you say, well, you're being kind of harsh. Now, here's the thing. I'm not talking about there is a time where when you get saved, you're going to go through a time of being nervous. It may be kind of awkward reaching out to people and everything. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. But I'm just talking about just someone who, who basically is saved and they, they're, they're saved, but yet they don't know the scripture. They can't turn to, you've been saved for a while. You can't turn to the scripture to show anybody I think that's a shame if someone asks you to, hey, show me how to get saved, and, and you, well, well, you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, this is, here's the thing. The same way you got saved is how they're going to get saved. So that's why it's, it's a pet peeve of mine because I'm a firm believer that everybody who's saved ought to be able to show other people how to get saved. That's just where I stand. And, and I'm not saying that everyone has to have the same type of flow, the same type of, you know, rhythm of turning to this scripture first and that scripture. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is the fundamentals of just giving the gospel, everybody should know how to do. And what a shame if you receive a doctrine and you don't know how to teach it. You can't, you can't show someone else why you believe what you believe. That's a problem. The house of Rechab. They knew the doctrine. They knew the doctrine. They were firm on it. If you're in Jeremiah chapter 35, verse 6 and 7 is where we left off at, where they say, neither shall ye, this is the instruction that they received that, Jeremiah is saying, hey, drink wine. They, Jeremiah just spoke about wine. They went, be, they went beyond wine. He said, drink wine. They said, no wine. But then they said, verse 7, neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strained. They just went beyond just drinking wine. They're firm on what they know and what they believe. That is a lesson to us that Get settled on the doctrine. Know what you believe. Don't just receive it. Know it. Let it get in you. Put the scriptures in your heart as well. That's the third lesson. Here's the fourth one. Let me get to it. Sorry. The 
The fourth lesson that we learned from the Rechabites is that the Rechabites are a peculiar people. The Rechabites are a peculiar people. If you look at verse 6 and 7, the end of verse 7, they said, this is the command given to them, ye shall drink no wine, neither, neither ye nor your sons forever, neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. They are a people who are peculiar. Does that mean that they're strange? No. But they're, they're peculiar. They don't blend in with the world. They say we don't drink wine. We don't do so seeds. We don't have vineyards. We don't have house. They're just a different people. And obviously, isn't that what we're commanded to be? A peculiar people? Not blending in with the world? And the thing is, they didn't blend in with anybody around them. They're just all to themselves. And they're just doing their own thing. They're just a peculiar people. They live by a different standard is what we see with them. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. You don't have to turn that. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. They are a peculiar people. I think about when I hear this scripture I just read, I think about these people. They, they live a separated. They didn't blend in with the world. And I think that's another reason why God probably looked out and, and said, I want to use them. Because not only could they just hold their father's instructions, but they just live a different life. There's nothing wrong with how they were living but just still in general, they are a good example of a peculiar people. They are not intertwined with the world. And here's the thing. This is just my opinion with, with Jonadab, their father. I think really when you look at verse 6 and 7, what we just read, I believe that, you know, uh, Jonadab probably had a, a mindset that his sons, his daughters, his children, that they were pilgrims that they were strangers in this land. It, to me, when he's giving them this instruction, it, it seems as though he doesn't want them to get comfortable is, what, is how I see things. And that they are pilgrims. And, and I look at us as saved people. This is not our home. Don't get comfortable here. This is how I look at Jonah Dad. Well, he's saying, don't get comfortable here. Don't sow seed here. Don't, don't uh, place all your stock here is what I see with Jonah Dad, their father. Hebrews 11, 13, you don't have to turn there, the faith chapter. The Bible says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. I like look at the end of verse 7 in Jeremiah chapter 35, because Jonadab's words here to his house, the house of Rechab. One thing I think is interesting is how he end when he's telling them, neither shall they build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, and so on. I like what he says at the end of the verse. He says that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Doesn't that sound like many times what God told them? That if they obeyed, that they would remain in the land, that they would be blessed in the land and everything. It seems as though Rechab has the same words for his children. That if they live the separated life and, and were that peculiar people, he says that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. There's a proverb that says the same thing, right? That if you were to obey God's words, they would give you length of days. You would have long life. The fourth lesson that we've seen is that the Rechabites are peculiar people. Here's another 
lesson from the Rechabites is that the Rechabites, they honor the son of Rechab. They honor the son of Rechab. Look at verse 6. It says, but they said, notice these words, we will drink no wine for Jonadab. Notice this, the son of Rechab, our father. So who is Jonadab? He's the son. But who is Rechab? Rechab is the father. But Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us. So who gave the commandment? Jonadab, who is the son? Who is his father? The Rechabite, Rechab. So they're just known as the house of Rechab, but it's the son who gave the instructions that they should live this separated life. Look at uh, the Bible again, verse 6. But they said, we will drink no wine for Jonadab, the son of Rechab. Our father commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Notice verse 8 closely. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father. And all that he had charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in. Neither have we, neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. Verse 10 again. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. This is really interesting. They call Jonadab. Well, Jonadab is the son. Rechab is the father. But then yet in verse 10, they call Jonadab our father. I think that's interesting there, that they honor the words of the son. Let's go to the gospel of Mark chapter 12. Gospel of Mark chapter 12, very famous passage of scripture here. <clears throat> and we can look, tie this in back to the, the Rechabites, how the Rechabites, they honor the son, the son who gave the commandments, gave the instructions, and they honor his word. Verse 12 here, excuse me, Mark 12 says, and he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set an hedge, and set an hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and led it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season, he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent unto them another servant. And at him, they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again, he sent another and they killed him and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, they will receive, they will reverence my son, excuse me, they will reverence my son. But those husbands said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. <clears throat> We see here in Mark 12 where the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about a man, and obviously this is talking about him, where, where the father here, the husbandman, send servants to, to bring in the fruit of the vineyard. But when they bring in, when they go out, they're coming back empty. They, they're not giving, they're not rendering the fruit that they should. So another servant is sent unto them. What happens with that servant? Well, he's beat, he's killed. Some are stoned. But then the owner of the vineyard says, I'm going to send my son. They're going to reverence my son. And what do they do with him? It's a picture. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me, not a picture. It is the Lord Jesus Christ here as, as ultimately is who he's talking about. And what do they do? They kill him. Do they receive the son here? No, they don't. They kill him. Okay, go back to the Rechabites. Interesting about the Rechabites is that they receive the words 
of Jonadab, who is the son of Rechab. And, and here's the thing. What I like about them is that they don't put a separation between, well, this is what the father said and, and well, this is what the, the son said. No, they just said, hey, the son said it and, and we, we just received that. That's what we're going to believe. Now you say, what's the big deal? Because isn't that what people do today where there's a separation? Well, well, God, the father is this, but he said that about sodomy, but Jesus said nothing about sodomy. Trying to separate the two. No, what, what, what God the Father said on sodomy, God the Son believes the same and will reiterate the same when it comes to sodomy. There is no separation, and that's what people want to do. They want to have God the Father, and then they want to cast off the Son and say, well, no, nah, we want to have the Father, but the Son, no, nah, he, he's, he's on something else. Well, you, you can't have a separation. And the Rechabites here, they mention how Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us. And the words that they are repeating and the words that they have received are the words of the son. It's the words of the son. The Bible says, who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denied the father and the son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. There is no separation. You can't have one without the other. And that's what people want to do. I believe in God the Father. But Jesus, no, no. It's, it's a package deal. It's a package deal. You cannot have one without the other. But just getting back to the Rechabites, they tell you the son commanded us these things. And he's the, and our father is Rechab. But the son, these are the words that, that they have received from the son. It's a good lesson for us that don't put any separation and don't fall into the world's traps of trying to get you to pin Jesus against the father and the father against Jesus. No, they, they on one accord. They on one accord. What one said, the other said as well. You can't separate the two. The fifth lesson was that the Rechabites honor the son. The son is Jonadab. The father is Rechab. Yet they receive the son's words, Jonadab. <clears throat> Here's the sixth lesson that we learn from them. Actually, I'm, I'm going to skip this one for time's sake. I'm going to skip this one. This one was just going to be the fact that they teach the doctrine to their children. They teach the doctrine to their children. Verse 8, if you're following along with me, verse 8 mentions that. It says, thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, and all that he had charged us to drink no wine all our days. We, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters. Notice how they taught it to their children as well. I'm going to skip that point. Um, but it's just uh, something to think about. Listen, we need to teach the doctrine, the word of God to our children as well. Um, here's the, the last thing I'm going to touch on. I'm just going to jump to my closing thoughts here, and I'm going to close here. The closing thoughts, if you're there in Jeremiah chapter 35, this is just something that I thought about, and it really pricked me in my heart where I was looking at this house of the Rechabites, and, and I hope it can help you out as well. Closing thought with the Rechabites, something to notice about the Rechabites is that the Rechabites lived in Jerusalem, but they were not compelled to be part of the people of God. Think about that. They lived in Jerusalem, but they were not compelled to be part of the people of God. Well, remember, they told you why they came to Jerusalem. But notice that God had to call, get Jeremiah to call them. And then they mentioned here, you can tell that they just pretty much live in a separated life. They're not living like the people of Jerusalem who have houses and vineyards and all. But at the same time, they're living in Jerusalem. They, they, they're near God's people, but they were not compelled to be part of God's people. Mm. What a shame, right? 
how they can live near people who are called people of God, people who are called God's children, yet they were not compelled to be part of them. What a shame, right? And you think about this, why is it that they were not compelled to be part of the house? This is just my opinion, but I believe I'm right when I'm saying this. Why is it that they would not want to be part of? Well, think about the days of Jeremiah. The days, the days of Jeremiah. Is it a day where they're just seeking after God? Is it a day where they, they're, they're sacrificing unto God the, the, right, the, the right sacrifices? It, do they have godly kings on the throne? No. We started out in verse 1. It says, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim. Is Jehoiakim a good king? What did he reign for? Three months? Three months and he was carried off. They, they have wicked kings on the throne. They're, they're worshiping the devil. They're serving idols, so they're worshiping the devil. They're killing and sacrificing their children in the fire to the devil. Why would you want to be a part of those people? Yeah, they live near God's people, but they're not compelled to be near, to get to know God like that. What a shame, right? Shame on us if we live such a wicked life where people are not compelled to know more about God. Shame on us if we go to work and we live and we talk so, so terrible. We're swearing everywhere all around the job. It, 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 things don't go right. You blowing up. You got a bad attitude with the, with the boss. Well, shame on you if that's how you work. Shame on you if you just live a wicked life when you live here. And people are not compelled to know Christ. Shame on us, right? The Rechabites were not compelled to be part of the people of God. Here's another thing, another closing thought. The Rechabites were set as the example. Think about that. The Rechabites were set as the, were set as the example to look to. I mentioned earlier how God's eyes is not just on the saved, but it's on those who are not saved as well. Those who are not part of the household of faith, God sees what they do as well. The Rechabites, not part of the house of Israel. Yet God set them as the example. He set them as the benchmark and say, this is how it should be done. That's a shame, right? Where God looks not at his children and say, that is how it should be done. But he look at the unsaved, someone who is not even part of the church and says, that's how somebody should work on their job. That is how a husband should. The guy is not saved, but that is how a guy should love his wife. She's not saved, but that is how she should reverence her husband. This guy is not saved, but he's a workaholic. Shame on us if God used someone other than his children to set the benchmark as to how it should be done. No, we should be the trendsetters. We should be the trailblazers. We should be those that the world look at and say, man, truly God is in you. What must I do to be saved? We are to be looked at as the example. The Rechabites, the Lord told Jeremiah, go get them. Bring, bring them here. And the whole purpose of this is that he's using them as the example. Here's the, the last closing thought here. Jeremiah chapter 35, look at verse 18 through 19. Last thought I'm going to close on is just, it's just clear that God is not a respecter of a person. Look at verse 18. The Bible says, And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts. He's using them, looking at them, and saying, This is how it should be done. 
because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done according unto all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. But they're the Rechabites. But, but they're the Hittites. Oh, they're this and that ites. You think that matters with God? These people who were not of Israel, God said, I got a place for them. Because they obey their father. Here's the thing. If you can obey your earthly father and keep your earthly father's commandments, what can you do for God? Great chance you will keep his commandments, right? Last verse I'm going to close on, Acts 10. You don't have to turn there. Acts 10, verse 34 through 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Is that not what we see with the Rechabites? In every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I wanted to use the Rechabites because I, I have read this chapter so many times and it stopped me in my tracks every single time. And it's just like these people, who are they? Yet they're used as the example. You know, so I, I, I pray that this was a, a blessing to you guys, you know, and just to give a refresher on, you know, uh, what these lessons are. We got the fact that God always has his eyes on us. Be mindful of that. That also, uh, you know, there is unity in the house of the Rechabites. Make sure that we have unity amongst us as well. They know the doctrine. You know, make sure you study. Make sure you study the word of God. Know the doctrine, right? Then not only that, you know, uh, a peculiar people. That's what we are. That is what we should be, that peculiar people. But then at the same time, they honor the son. Make sure we hold true to the, honor, the, the words of the son. Don't let there be a separation. Don't fall into the separation where people are trying to uh, get you against the father and against the son. No, we receive it all. And also teach it to your children. But also, lastly, as I mentioned, the shameful things that we talked about where they're used as the benchmark, as the example. You be the example. You be the light of the world. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this word here. Thank you for the book of uh, <clears throat> Jeremiah where he is using the Rechabites as an example. Forgive us, Lord, for any time we have not been the light of this world, Lord God, and have uh, been obedient unto your word and uh, been disobedient unto your word, Lord. Excuse me. Excuse me. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to always continue to grow, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, bless us as we leave here this evening. And pray that you would uh, allow us to uh, meet here again on Wednesday. In your son Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.